I could. I could. Loving God in heaven, we thank you so much for the Sabbath day you've given us. We thank you for all the beautiful messages and interaction and discussions we've had today, Lord. And uh, we trust that your spirit has been leading us today. And we ask that you would lead us now in this uh, study. And we thank you for all those who are here and all those who are unable to be here. Pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay. I wanted to go back to Isaiah 51, 3, verse 3, just briefly. And I don't know if I'm going to have, if I have help with you guys drawing things out or what. I don't know if you can, or you guys can choose to make that. I, I don't think I can myself. Oh, yeah, I can. Like that, right? Now you can see it. You can see the board anyways? Yes, you've, you've pinned it for as a spotlight. Yeah. Um, so verse three, for the Lord shall comfort Zion. There's a lot that I just don't, I still myself don't understand as to, um, I guess say who's who. We saw that, we saw that in our studies that it's Isaiah talking, and then he goes on and says it's Israel, and then we know it's Christ, and so we've understood that it's the instruction of how Christ learned of himself, so we see it's how we're learning of ourselves. But still, when it says Zion, he will comfort Zion, um, and I don't know if there's a difference between Zion and the, and the arm. That, that's one of the questions, one of the thoughts that I, that I wanted to maybe we can work on. So the Lord shall comfort Zion, or is Zion the whole, is Zion the church, is Zion the bride? I, don't, I mean, these things I'm still struggling with, so maybe somebody else has answers as we go through this. So, so for the Lord shall comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. So he's going to comfort Zion, all of her waste places. So Zion has waste places. Can we 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 can say that, right? Zion has. So, go ahead. So are we, are we doing? Um, just to clarify and summarize what we're doing today, we're doing a summary of Isaiah fifty-one, or or no, what? We're just gonna look at it again, or we're gonna probably jump into fifty-two. But I wanted to look at this verse. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, I just want to know where the so I I know where to put my mind because um I, I get spread or sp <laughs> spread out <laughs> spread it too. But. I mean, okay. it might might wind up being like a review, but I kind of just wanted to revisit at least this verse before jumping into fifty two. Yeah, only because okay. I there were some things in it that I don't think we looked at before, and I wanted to, and maybe we did look at them before, but I forgot. Um, so that maybe we never ca never came up with an answer. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we understood um, different parts of it, but I never, I don't recall looking at um, what are her waste places. Waste places is you go into the concordance and you'll see that it's desolate, right? And we know that we know that um, there's a desolating power, right? We got to keep in the context of back in Isaiah's time. And what he's talking about, but so desolate means waste. Uh, um, uh, waste means desolate. A, a waste place means desolate. In verse nineteen, it talks about that desolation. That where it says these two things are come upon, come unto thee, who shall be sorry for thee? Desolation and destruction, and the famine and the sword. By whom shall I comfort thee? So. They're, so they're in this, and that's talking about captivity, I think we all understood. So they're in captivity, and it's uh, waste places, desolate. So, so what I wanted to ask in this verse, if you look in the verse itself, what are... Which one? Three places? or six? Huh? Verse three. Three. 
Great, okay. What are these waste places? In the verse itself, verse three. Hey, stop. stop, stop, stop. stop. So what it, are, is it a repeat and large? So is it the um, the wilderness and the desert? That's what I think, yeah. So, but what is the wilderness and the desert? Because those are symbolic too, right? Yeah, that's where I wanted to go. That's where I wanted to go. So the waste is the desolate place, right? So the wilderness and the desert. And the reason I did that, because I don't know if you can bring it up to this experience up here, but that's what I was thinking. So the waste places are the wilderness and the desert. What happened with Christ when he was in the wilderness? When he, he was baptized, right? And he goes into the wilderness. He's tested. He's tested. He's, he's fasting. So tested temptation? Yeah. So the temptations, and we went through that last week, if you remember, what were the, what were they? What, the message, so. Um, yeah, that's, that's, um, I'm going to try to pull up. Hang on one second. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, I needed to see it too. So, so the stones, it was to turn the stones into bread. To bread. And what did the stones represent? The message, right? No, the bread it was the message. What did the stones represent? The people? Yeah, so the world is the word she uses. And the bread is the message. Oh, right. Okay. So, so before when it's a stone, it's a person. And after it's turned to a bread, it's a message. That's, I was getting confused. <laughs> no, you want to turn the stones into bread. You want to turn the world into the message. You want to go to the okay. world for a message instead of this movement. Uh, oh, you... I, I put it on share screen. I don't know if you were following that. But let me get the rest of them written down there first. Okay, cast down. I think the first one is the only one that I want to look at. Well, um, for everybody, because we're because she's sharing screen with the presentation. But if you were to uh, individually, if we were to go to the three dots where Elaine's picture is and um, pin it, oh, it, it won't pin it. I'm going to take it out the share screen off anyways. I just wanted to get that for all of us. Um, myself okay. included. Okay. I wanted to make sure that I got that part. If I don't get knocked over over here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the waste places are the wilderness and the desert. That's what the verse tells us, right? Right. So the wilderness, he's in the wilderness. He's fasting, you said, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fasting, so there's no food, right? No, yeah, there's food. no message. No message. So there's no message in the wilderness. And what's the desert? Isn't it just like the wilderness? What? Hey, isn't ahead. it the same as the wilderness? Well, I think we want to take the characteristics of it. What? What? What's okay. the desert? Right. Um, I've got H uh, sixty one fifty. It says in the sense of sterility, ster like sterile. A desert, especially with the article projects the generally sterile valley of the Jordan and its continuation to the Red Sea. Uh, Araba, champion, desert, evening, heaven, flame, wilderness. Kind of has them as both, doesn't it? Yeah. But if you went into a desert, what's there? Or what's not there? It 
there's no water. Water, there's no water, right? And so what's water? Also, there's a little no, oh, no, or no food. Yeah, that's uh, for the bread, for the wilderness, no, no. We're gonna see, I think, that they say the same things, but we wanna break down the characteristics of each. So when, there's, when you're in a desert, there's no water in a desert, right? What does that mean? It's water people? In this? Uh, no, the sea would be people. The sea is people. What is? If, there, no. if, there's, if there's no water, it's hard to survive. Yeah. Yes. Is there no message? What is? Why is water also no message? message? Why would you say no message? Because uh, it's a drought. And um, in the wilderness, there's no food, like a compare and contrast that there's no food in the desert, um, there's no message. If there's no water in the desert, I'm just, I'm just comparing contrasting. Maybe there's no message there. There are five way marks, right? And the four dispensations, what's this one? Oh, so plowing. And this one? Early rain. Latter rain. There's no rain. There you go. There's no rain. And rain equals. A message. A message. <laughs> you get that? Okay. That one just hit me right between the eyes. <laughs> so it's in the wilderness. And the stones are the world. You want to turn the stones to bread. The bread is a message. The bread is a message. So they're so they're the waste places are the wilderness and the desert, and both represent a message, right? <laughs> so message. Um, he's going to comfort Zion. Comfort all her waste places. Make the wilderness like Eden and the desert like the garden of the Lord. Now, if you're going to take that and compare and contrast, what's Eden and the garden of, Lord, of the Lord? So in Eden, there was plenty of food and water. Mm -hmm. So there was a message. Well, using the verse, what is what is Eden? What, what verse are we on? Huh? Verse? Uh, verse three. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so Eden. if you're. Uh, Eden would be heaven. The verse, what is Eden? Guard. A verse garden. Three. Garden of the Lord. Isaiah 51, where she talked about Isaiah 51 for 100 years. Wait, what'd she say? What'd you say? What'd she say? I didn't catch it. Okay. Okay, so the Eden is the garden of the Lord. They're in the waste places where there's no message. We see that from wilderness and desert. We can see that there's no message in the waste desolate places. We saw in just a kind of a quick reference, verse 19, that while they're in captivity, there's two things that come upon them, desolation and destruction, and famine in the sword. Right? Right. Uh, yeah, famine in the sword. And I don't know if this is a cause and effect on this, but because the sword... I'm kind of looking at both verses, mostly three. But the sword is the word of God, right? The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, right? 
So there's a famine. What's the famine? No word of God. No word of God. Okay. But he's going to make this waste place, which is the wilderness and desert, which has no message. He's going to make it like the garden of the Lord. I don't know if we looked at it like this or not before. So I just like kind of wanted to bring it back out. Does anybody have any comments or any input? Anybody? Anything wrong up, up here with it? I don't see anything wrong, but I don't um, think so. So looking at this then, and we're here, if this were the three spractal and this is harvest, we have no message. Right, because that's what we see here in the harvest. This is the harvest of the priest. No message in, in the wilderness. But he's going to make this like the garden of the Lord, if I understand that correctly. So, what's the message here? Because there's no message, right? The rain came here. What was the message? For our time? Yeah. Yeah. Quality? You mean equality? Equality. Yeah. Equality. I don't know if you can read that. It's juggling. So, yeah, equality. So, he made this like the like Eden and what's Eden Garden of the Lord yeah the Garden of the Lord freedom equality equality I was going to say freedom but we might want to think about freedom because there are people that are saying God is freedom and there's no rules remember that yeah yeah. So verse three, he's going to make comfort Zion. Maybe somebody look up comfort. Comfort Zion in all her waste places, which means desolate. And her waste places are the wilderness and the desert, which we saw both can take you to. There's no message. There's no bread in the wilderness. And there's no water, no rain. Because it's harvest, so it doesn't rain. But yet, even though there's no rain, even though there's no message, he comforts Zion. And makes it like Eden. I don't know what that means in Isaiah's time, though. Does anybody have any thoughts? Because that's where we're supposed to look at. Anybody? Oh, the word means to be, if, if you want the meaning, it's to be sorry. Console oneself, repent, regret, comfort, be comforted. So to be sorry, a lot of it has to be due to be sorry. That's Brown Driver Briggs. But Strong says properly to sigh, that is to breathe strongly. By implication to be sorry, that is to pity, console to avenge, comfort, ease, repent. 
sounds more like to be sorry than yeah than console. Think about comfort. I think about this period here that we've been in and the review that we've been doing. We came into this, this period without understanding what was already given here. When we started to, when the light dawned on us, let's put it that way. Um, because we didn't totally under, we didn't totally fully understand, and the light shines brighter on us as we continue to look past through the past histories and, and line up the the, um, the um, line upon line as well, and the light really shines. I mean, just think about what we saw last night with the Battle of Ipsus. That 2016 was about gender, about um, women's rights, and LGBT rights because to have elected Hillary Clinton, Clinton would have stood for all that God is standing for. So we didn't even see it there. So we were in bad shape, right? So we come here and he still gives us all this time. And as the light begins to dawn on us, What's our response? What might our response be? Confusion. What was that? I said confusion. Confusion. <laughs> I'm turn my volume up. I think the dog's in here. Confusion. I'm saying, I'm sorry. Yeah, confusion. I was saying it kind of, oh, I don't know what the term is, but, you know, I, I would not guess, I would guess that people were confused as we progressed into this message. Um, maybe it was just me. I don't know, but I know that's not the answer you were looking for. Well, I am not the artist. I heard this talked about earlier. If uh, I am not the artist here. But if we had a brick, I think it was said earlier, that brick didn't hit us until we got here in the head. Why would God throw a brick at our head? Get our attention. Yeah. So that kind of takes me to the next part that is more so I want to talk about maybe next week with the study next week. But he puts his word in our mouth. And that's, um, well, there's a couple of verses on that one. But there's one that I wanted to, back in chapter 49, verse 2. He's made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. We broke that down structurally. We saw that the shadow of his hand is a quiver. The quiver is what holds arrows. And we looked up polished shaft, which said that it was an arrow. So the mouth, he makes, let's see, make sure I read it right. He makes the mouth like a sharp sword. So he's put, we saw it in it's chapter 51 where it says, I think it's 15 or 16, where he puts his word in our mouth. So he makes our mouth like a sharp sword. And, and that sharp sword is um, in, in defined any, at least in the concordance in this one, is a quiver in a quiver, in the shadow of his hand, which is a quiver. So he can take, you guys help me if I'm, if I'm wrong on this, but 
He can take us as if we're an arrow because his word is in our mouth and pull back that, whatever you call it. If it's, I don't know if you call that the bow. I don't know what part you call it where you pull back. And he can shoot that arrow where he wants to shoot it. Right? Yes. Like maybe right between the eyes. Get the attention. Yeah. Or like a brick. To hit us. So he's been trying to do that with us. The one thing I want to, and I probably won't go into because I don't know that I'm prepared to, but I want us to at least to think about is the priests at, this is the cross, and they're 30 years old, right? I think I had to ask the question. What's the difference between you on this side and this side? This side of 30 or this side of 30? Well, if you're at 30, you're, you're qualified to become a priest. And before that, you're not. Okay, so. If you're looking at literal time. So what are you then here? You're younger. What is a younger person? Student. Yeah, keep going. An apprentice. If you're going into a priest, you'd be an apprentice. What does Paul say? Child. Babe. You're a child. What are you then over here? Adult. An adult. Grown. So now, here, now here's a question, a question from what I'm hearing you say. You're using language like uh, polished shaft and arrow and sword, and those are instruments of war, um, you know, used for one purpose only, you know, either to bring meat to the table or to take down a foe, defend yourself, what kind of thing. Um, it's just a, it's just an observation. I'm just putting yeah, that. Yeah, good observation because they are weapons of war. And uh, this is another one. I don't, I'm I'm really bad at figuring out how to ask the questions. But the rain, when the rain comes down, you have the people in this movement. You have the people that left the movement. You have the Adventist church. You have the people of the world. Who does the rain come down on? Everybody. Whole, everyone. Everybody. Everyone. Everybody. So that weapon of war that you brought up, it goes towards everybody. And it's going to be the word of God. It's going to be a message. And it's going to hit some people that will that will hear it and understand it and what happens to other people you're oblivious to it oblivious to it yeah they don't hear nothing and and actually what what does that weapon of war do to them it hardens them I don't think it does anything. If they resist it. I think Harden was okay, but I was thinking more that it destroys them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It'll destroy them. It'll lead to their ultimate destruction. We know yeah. that, but yeah. it doesn't destroy them in the minute, but it right. destroys their opportunity for eternal life. I know, I, I'm, I know I've said this before, but it's one of, one of the spots that I struggled with for years understanding and I understand it better now, and it's it's in um, it's in testimonies to ministers, page five hundred six, and it rolls onto page five hundred seven. And and I'm paraphrasing. It says that the the latter rain will be being poured out on hearts all around, and but there will be some that are in the midst of these who are receiving the latter rain, 
who will be completely oblivious, literally oblivious that it's even happening. Yeah. And when it, 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 that's hard to understand at one level, but learning what we're learning now, it helps us to realize that that's exactly the case. Yeah. If you go back into here and you got the plowing and then there's a seed planted, right? And then you're going to have a plant grow. The wheat and the tares grow together along the way. Um, but the seed, it depends on who planted that seed to what you are. So then you get your early rain and you get your latter rain. Think of Pharaoh. When Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And what did he do? Put in his heart. Yeah, he hardened his heart. And it was a gradual thing that, like Bob says, it leads to their destruction by rejecting. And to put in relationship with the, the weapon of war, um, that seed, what I, from what I understand, has to die and be buried before it can grow a new plant. And so these are arrows that we actually want to hit us and die to self so we can be soldiers of god yeah right we should be we should i used to i it's been a long time but before i was in this message but i used to um, actually say it give us the hard stuff give us stuff that hurts us hit us in the eyes and hurt us <laughs> because that's the only thing you it gets know our attention yeah well it's not just that it gets our attention it's like if okay if, remember when i talked about goal setting you know yeah. the goal the goal is eternity And, and if this is our goal, but our actions are, oh, I don't want to hear that, or I don't want to study, or I'm not going to listen to that, or I don't believe that person, you know, and all that, and all that is going on, or you're saying, Lord, help me to get here. Yeah. And when you ask him, help me to get here, and you take the steps to get there as adults, as adults that we are now, we should understand, we should by now understand that, that it actually hurts and maybe causes pain and humiliation, but all is for our good. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, we have to understand that God is preparing you, so he has to humble you. That's the only way you can accept that message that he's sending. If you're not in that humble state, you can't you can't absorb the the message he's given you. Right. Your humanity gets in the way. And, and speaking of that, you you were we were talking about um, the message coming down and how some people would not get it. Uh -huh. It kind of reminds me of the story when Jesus was born and King Herod, you know, knew not of, of, of Jesus' birth, but yet wise, wise men from the East had gotten a, that something was happening by the star that was up, up above the sky. And uh, it kind of just reminded me of the, the topic we were talking about earlier about the the whys and um in the donna's presentation about being wise and and uh and that kind of thing i guess i think that what makes us to be to the point of being the wise is understanding that the journey is going to hurt along the way yeah. our submission to the journey submission to the lord in this journey is a painful humbling experience at times sometimes not, more than others sometimes pain is not it's not a bad thing no it not, lets you know not. lets you know something is going on and something needs your attention you might be you know in recognizing when he shines light on something that you were in complete darkness of and look at with the message of equality and sexism okay. um it shines a, a light on our sexist behavior and we have a choice to make as adults as adults it's kind of interesting because does that mean that the other side is adults too 
only hardened adults? I don't know. Um, because you can get you can get that stony heart that cannot be changed. So I was um, on Thanksgiving. I went to my daughter's and and they had a a friend come over. I had no idea the guy was a Christian. I won't go into the details of of that, but I found out he's Christian anyways. So fast forward, uh, sometime last week or so, I was a uh, on Instagram is kind of it's different than Facebook, but kind of like you know the friends thing was. Anyways, it comes up with with suggestions of people to follow, and I usually just kind of do what I what I'm doing in there and leave. But it caught my attention because it was somebody that it said Jesse follows. And I thought I don't know why I looked to see who it was, and I didn't know who it was. And I didn't I didn't think anything of it. I just when I, but for whatever the reason, I think I had to actually open his profile to see what I saw, I think, or something drew me to look at. I don't know, but I don't remember. I've been so busy this last couple of weeks, but, but I'm looking at this, at who this guy is. And I don't remember if I saw a picture of him at first. I just saw that he was posting things that kind of showed that he really loved the Lord. You know what I mean? So that kind of, of course, with my daughter, I'm totally... Uh, it, it's not her boyfriend it's, it's a friend of theirs but you know that being my daughter and she's following this I'm like well your heart just kind of goes up a beat you know <laughs> hope I don't think she'll ever listen to this but I did actually have this conversation with her but you kind of have hope and um but the reason I bring that up is because a couple of nights ago I realized who it was and I was like oh duh. you know it was the guy that was at her house that night and I I, I didn't know and so I talked with him just a couple minutes back and forth but I did ask him how long because he mentioned that he um, went through the most difficult time in his life last year and and it brought him to Christ and I don't remember exactly what he said beyond that but brought him to Christ and he is just really um, grateful and and you could, uh, it's like, you know, sometimes you can just see somebody really seems to love the Lord. They may not know anything, but, or may know something, who knows, but they really, there, there was just something that was, that was, there was a love that was seen there, even if it's not knowing everything. So, but my point was, is that he had to go through a difficult time to come to the Lord. So it's painful sometimes. It's painful. And, and, um, and in, in our perspective here of learning a message the message is painful and that's something that he and many others will have to face but if we really love the lord we'll take that pain and humiliation and make the required changes but but it is as we've been on this journey we've had to deal with trials and we've talked about trials a lot and had to deal with trials and and go through that um pain and suffering and but if it weren't for those trials, would we be here? And then, uh, huh? Probably not. Or maybe. Maybe, yeah. I, I, I'm with you on the maybe. Go ahead and explain your thoughts on that. You're referring to me? No, uh, Francisco, I think. Francisco, yeah. And then you next if you want, but go ahead. Um. Well, when I came to Christianity, I was like that guy Jonah. God was saying, go this way. I wanted to go the other way. I didn't really want to, didn't really interest me. But I, I was giving it an honest attempt because my wife was convicted and wanted to seek the church in, in Christianity. And I said, well, if it's important to my wife, then it's important to me. So I'll I'll do it and but I'll have to do it honestly because this is this is God I'm dealing with. I can't be just going in there, you know, willy-nilly. And then when uh, the truth was presented to me, I, I I couldn't I couldn't turn my back on it. Just couldn't turn turn my back on it, you know, just the, the 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 path was open to me right there and I, I had to step forward. 
Yeah, she studied with us for quite a while before you joined us. And how many times, Christine, did I ask you, hey, how's Francisco doing? Is he maybe looking at any of this? <laughs> uh, it, it didn't make any sense to me at all. Yeah. You know, I, but you know what? It, it didn't have to. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, it, it was like when a parent tells you, come here right now, you know, you don't think about it. You just go because you, you're trusting them that, that something's happening. So you go. And when that that path was presented to me, it was I, I trusted in it because I knew something was there that I didn't fully understand, but but I knew it was it was something that I needed to investigate and go forward and 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 mm -hmm. And it was something that me and my wife were seeking anyways, you know, even though I was more, I was reluctant to go in. But um, praise God that you're here. Oh, yeah. So, Bob, yeah. what were you going to say? Um, well, segueing on what, what's already been said a little bit, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think if we're all honest with each other and with ourselves, we would realize that at some level, when we were first exposed to Christianity more in a formal way that um, that we were all of us were kind of kicking at the pricks you know we weren't we weren't wanting to go the direction that God wanted us to go um, and and so that that's part of our our our, um, our experience that we have and I know we're talking about about the trials and the difficulties and without those trials and difficulties it's very clear from a lot of statements in the spirit of prophecy anyway that we wouldn't be heaven bound if it weren't for those things so I, I firmly believe that none of us would be part of this movement if it wasn't for god bringing us through you know some hard knocks i mean that's this is how god has to work things out in this world otherwise we would just become so comfortable and complacent with wherever we were and we wouldn't leave from that spot. So, I mean, that's kind of how God has made it work. But um, from the standpoint of people hardening their hearts, we know that that is a process as well. It's not something that happens, as, as Elder Tess would say, in a vacuum. You know, there's a whole bunch of decisions that are made along the way, and there's little elements of rays of truth, if I could put it that way, that have to be continually rejected and it just makes it that much harder to receive the truth later, you know. And so the the more you harden your heart, the easier it is to continue to harden your heart. And you look at the situation with Pharaoh. I know it's worded in the scripture. It says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, to say that God would harden anybody's heart is 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 misreading the word, you know, because we know that that you know God is just saying that <laughs> based on the truth, you know, He hardened His own heart, and it didn't happen in one. And one fell swoop either, and Jesus Himself makes it so clear that that He says it right before He comes again in the clouds that that it's going to be like it was in Noah's day, and I I look at the story of Noah with a lot of intrigue because we know what the animals represent the clean and the unclean animals and what Noah represented, and yet you look at the message and He preached it for 120 years. That's a long time to be preaching a message of truth. And yet, and yet, when the, at the very end was coming, and the flood hadn't happened yet, and people could technically could get act, get on the ark, God decided, okay, I'm going to manifest my divine power, and I'm going to have all these animals just get on the ark in a very orderly fashion. You know, Noah didn't have to sit there and corral them up and and force them on the ark. They all just came on perfectly in order, and that was a divine manifestation of His power. And you would think. Elaine, if anybody was on the fence, and Satan owns the fence, by the way, but if you were sitting on the fence and you were trying to decide, should I get on the ark or shouldn't I get on the ark? You see all these animals just getting on in perfect order. You'd think, you'd think maybe I should get on the ark too, but nobody got on the ark because they had already closed their own probations. Even though they were still living, they had already hardened their hearts to the point where they had already closed their own probations. They had already damned themselves and they already hardened their own hearts. And so that when the time came, at the time passed, and then that when the ark door was sealed, that's when it was officially closed. But I think that's only when when God, you know, basically wrote their death certificate because, you know, 
you don't write a death certificate unless you have a dead body, you know. And and I think people are are dead long before God writes their writes their their death certificates because people make their own decisions. That's just my two cents. Yeah, because they went through these steps. If you were to look at that as the 144,000, you know, line, the big line, they went through these steps and their reaction in these steps brought them to this place. Exactly. Right? Brought them to that place. So, yeah, I made a couple points I wanted to comment on, but I, I struggle to keep them fresh in my mind. Um, well, I wanted to tell you some. Uh, you know, because you're talking about the trials and bringing people to the truth to, to the Lord. And we know that's just true all over and over. And God even brings his people specifically into trials and that kind of stuff. And my, my testimony is like 180 degrees from that. So I just know God uses whatever he uses for the individual, because when I've decided that I was going to seek the Lord out, I was flying high. I was on the path to, you know, I had a, a wonderful job. I got our dream house going out in the mountains, had my beautiful wife, you know, I had our son and things were just like rolling. And I was on the track to like retire early kind of thing. And, and that's when God got me. So I wasn't in any kind of a trial. It was just that he knew what it was going to take and what it really took was my son when my son was born then all of a sudden all these memories came flooding back like when i was a kid like growing up as an adventist and had turned away you know when i got to be you know, old enough to make my own decisions so now i got my son and i'm like the holy spirit is just like banging on me like what are you going to do now how are you going to raise this boy and all these things are going flooding through my head and i'm just like okay lord i think you want me to figure this out as an adult <laughs> so you know that was my story it was just you know i was really in a good position and wasn't having any trials at all that i you know would say you know they're talking about people that are like lose their jobs and they're lose their health and they're living under a bridge and there was nothing like that for me yeah that's what i was going to kind of say when francisco was talking because that was that's why i kind of said i could see i could kind of go not go both ways i don't know how to say it but um because i believe that once we got on this path trials definitely come but for me i'm kind of like you there was nothing really going on i mean i was living a a life that I shouldn't have been living, but I mean, I had no big devastation or anything going on in my life. I just, there had been a few different times previously that I kind of had an interest in, in seeing what the Bible said. And yeah, and I, I never, I didn't even know what the Bible really was and I knew nothing. And so I remember taking the kids so like Marine World or something and staying in a hotel. And I knew the Bibles, they always had Bibles in the hotels. So I remember picking one up and then I think I read a few pages and thought, man, I don't even know what that said. And that was probably the end of it for, for a while. And then, but for like, like with you, I mean, I, I can look back now though, though, and I can see the Lord had, had prepared me for this particular step, but all of a sudden I wanted to read the Bible. And I got my, I ordered one off of Amazon, I guess, or whatever, and got my first Bible. And I don't even know if it was Amazon around then. But anyways, I got a Bible and, and I started reading. And I, but my first prayer, I wasn't a praying person. I wasn't a Christian. I believed in God. I had no idea who he was. I really didn't know who Jesus was. I mean, I, I hear the name, but I didn't know. And so I, I sat down not being a praying person and I just said, I don't know how there can be so many different beliefs in this world. Please show me the truth. And when I think back on that day and look at what we've come to understand now, I'm like, wow. But then you do really start going through some trials, but I really believe that the trials after the fact, after the fact, the trials um, are to strengthen our faith. Purify us. Yeah. Purify us and to strengthen our faith so that, when we go face, you know, the rest of this line, we go face the, 
if we were, because this would be the priests, if we're going to go face the rest of the, the people, you know, the, the Levites here and the Nethanims here, if we're going to go face them and, and we're not strong, let's say we go to the church and we go to give them a, a message, but some terrible thing happens to us, we get put in jail like Paul. We get put in jail. And if our response is, woe is me, what's going to be the response of the Levite? Amen. You're right. So, so we have to endure what we have to endure until, you know, we're in that fire, right? He puts us in that fire until we come out polished, until he can see us, if that's the right way to say that. So we can, so we can see him. We, yeah, so, so we can, so he can see himself, his own yeah. image and us. There you go. His own reflection. Then we're ready to go do this and get thrown in jail and not care because you know that all things work for good right to those that love god and if you wind up in jail it's because there's people here god wants to save and that needs to be our mindset that's that's when you have a sing-along like uh they right. had in prison you know right uh, i forget who was in the story but when they threw in jail they started started singing and singing hymns was yeah. it paul and silas yeah paul and silas but but they had to get to a place where self was dead. They had to get to a place where the things of this world meant nothing. And to me, it's always a challenge. It's always a challenge. Not that the things of the world mean anything to me, but we're still working and having to live secular lives, if that makes sense. I don't know if that's the right way to say that. We still have jobs and got to go and do about our daily basis, daily business and this and that. And it's, and it's like, you know, I remember on this journey thinking it would be so much easier if I didn't have to be involved in any of that. But being involved in that is what brings you to people. So, so we have to get to that place where these trials that we've endured here, we're looking back and we're praising God that and i've said this before i don't know to this group but i've said it to some of our local group anyways we have to be able to get to this place and and be able to praise god for every single trial because we wouldn't have the faith and we would go out there and cause harm i was going to say i lost my point um that i was going to make but 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 we wouldn't be able to go to those people with this complete, we're heavenly citizens. We're not citizens of this kingdom. We have to be like Job. So he slay me? Yeah, I trust him. Is that one? Yeah. Yeah. And then and also keep in mind what, what was Job told in the end? In the in the well, I don't mean the very end, but those last four or five chapters, who's speaking? Oh, his friends. No, it might have been the last three or four chapters. Not his friends. God. God. Are we ready to take that? I mean, that that that's I think that's what we're we're having to hear. To some extent in here, what Job had to hear. And uh how wrong he had it. But in, but he was faithful, right? He was faithful. He may not have understood everything, but he was faithful. And, and that's where, to me, that's where the trials are really necessary for us to be another part of us being safe to go to the Levites and the Nethanims, because if we're, our trials are wearing us down here, you know, we all go through stuff. We have to go through. I mean, it happens. We have to. I, I, I understand that. But how we respond to it. I don't know how to word it because I don't want anybody to be offended or crit feel criticized or anything like that. It's like, 
can our faith sustain it? Can I mean, because there's your faith and then there's, yeah, we're in trials and it's bearing us down and it's wearing us down. And it, it, because I know I've been there, this, this, um, probably since I moved out here is when I really started to notice it a lot. I mean, there were times where mentally I thought I was crushed and, and there was no more I could do. And I'd be on my knees in tears. It's like, I don't know what to do. I can't do any more than I already do. And I mentally felt, um, beyond exhausted, uh, like I couldn't function. Like I couldn't function. And yet what did I, do? I had to keep going. It's like, what am I going to do? And I would ask the Lord over and over again, what am I supposed to do? I can't quit work because I mean, I don't want to work. I tell him, I don't want to work. I just want to do what you want me to do. And, and somehow somewhere along the line, I must've picked up what needed to be because I still have to work. I still do all those things, but I'm at peace with it all. It's like, it doesn't, I don't know how to, to, to say it, but, but he wants to bring us to that level of peace. And I know I'm not saying I've arrived, but I know that it's a lot easier than it was a few years ago. And I don't know that much has changed. And, and so somewhere he brings us to that. And I think it's our cooperation level with him or our acceptance, or maybe being able to understand that trials are meant to trials are that fire, right? The fiery, the, the the fiery trials that you go through to polish us so he as christine said till he sees his image fully in us but it's but because of because he loves us he allows these things because and this is what i was going to say earlier because he knows we're going to come up to this place and and i would always picture it in my head him saying well elaine i know you're not ready to get to that spot. You're going to get there and you're going to shrink and you're going to fall back. You're going to run. And I don't want that to happen to you. I want you to be strong like a soldier. Ready to press on under any circumstance. So if you get thrown in jail, so what? There's somebody there that God wants you to be to speak to. So to me, that's where I think of the trials. But I I, I think that I I'm I'm with Francisco on the part that or no I think it was David David on the part that maybe before you come to the Lord it's maybe not always a trial. But I did start that with the the friend of my daughter's that, um, but I did ask him. Later, I did ask him, you know, did he always have religion in his life? So he said, yes, he was raised in a Christian family, but it wasn't until that trial. I had, I don't know about, I think David had Advent, Adventism background all this, all your life, right? I think. Yeah, I, I'm very cursed. I'm like a fourth generation Adventist. Yeah, I had, I had zip, nothing, no religion whatsoever. And it wasn't because I was I, I just, I mean, that's what I was raised. I just didn't, you know, I, I don't know how to say I didn't know. I didn't know when you get married, you had to go to the social security office and change your name. I mean, I didn't know these things and, and there was nobody teaching me these things. And so I'm just thankful that one day I wanted to know. That's all I can say. So it wasn't, huh? The bottom line really is, 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 you know, the Holy Spirit I've read in, 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 um, let's see, it steps to Christ that the spirit of God is drawing humanity to him long before we even recognize that that's what the spirit of God is doing. So he's trying to do it. He's going to work with whatever he can. And so, um, you know, a lot of people, he just, God knows each one of us individually. So he knows what it's going to take to bring us to a point where we actually start to recognize his spirit and then make a decision. And, and so it could be, as, as David was saying, you know, the birth of his son and things were going a certain way. And he's like, well, I've, I've got to figure this out because now I have to teach to the next generation. And, and, and or it could be that there's every different scenario under the sun. But I do know that some people, because I've heard their testimony, some people, you know, they get to the point where their life is so falling apart that there's nowhere they can look except up. 
you know, so the spirit of God knows what it takes for each individual to bring them into the beginning of that walk with him where we're actually recognizing now we're going to try to walk with God. But what your point is, is that once we start that walk with God, it's not a bed of roses. It, that's when the right. afflictions and the trials are going to come up for our purification. Right. I wrote that down so I'd remember in, at 9-11, not being 9-11, but, you know, 1989, 9-11. Anyway, so at 9-11, I didn't know anything. Back here, I wasn't nowhere to be found. But I was able to, as I got into this area here, I was able to look back at my life and recognize it and I didn't understand the significance of it really I knew it was beneficial to me but I didn't understand the significance of it until we started until we really started to open up equality to where we actually started to understand equality okay not just where it was opened up it was opened up in here and we didn't even know it but but back in here in this history actually back here because this is 1989 it was pre-1989 because I met my met my husband in 1989 so it was back here i was with somebody that was emotionally abusive and i probably shared some of this but i was with somebody that was emotionally abusive and i was like a doormat kind of person i was this weak um, insecure needy person and just wanted someone to love me <laughs> and uh and i just would always remember my one of my sisters saying you know if you she says, you have to learn to like yourself because they all knew what this guy was like. And I would make excuses. And she said, if you like, you need to learn to like yourself. And I'd say, I like myself just fine. She'd say, well, if you like yourself just fine, why do you let them treat you that way? And, and I'm getting mad, you know? I, I realize now though, that all of that experience was God wooing me because after five years of that, there was, it wasn't violent. And I would say it wasn't ever violent, but at the very end, it's like it, the potential definitely was there. And uh, and uh, there was a fight that could have ended bad, but that fight woke me up and said, this is wrong. <laughs> this is really wrong. And I got my own apartment and started, I wound up watching when Oprah Winfrey first started her show, watching her show and finding a book, a, a psychologist. I went and read the book. I shared the book with several people. Um, and, and, and all of that then made me want to go and, and be used to help others, other women that are in oppressive, abusive situations. And to the point that then when I get into this area here, I was working for Nordstrom and I actually got after, a, I mean, I'd been there for a while and, you know, we, we tend to get bored with, you know, especially when you're like a goal setting person and you want to challenge yourself and you've met that challenge and it's like well you can't you just can't rest you you just you just don't rest real well so you get bored and uh so at one point in time and during that time i actually thought about trying to go to school to be a counselor so that i could then go and help help um other people and help women but i didn't want to do it because i wanted to be a mom <laughs> and so i wound up married and and that kiss, so I didn't do it. But what it taught me was seed sowing way back here. So what Bob said, I think it was Bob, made me think of that too, is that it's way back in our life. We can trace in our life his wooing us to this place. And so I get here, in, in here, and I can look back over there and I can say, wow, it's like I can picture him talking to Job only he was talking to Elaine. <laughs> Just consider my servant Elaine. She doesn't know who I am. She doesn't even want to come to me, but I'm going to teach her a principle back here that she's going to be able to use here. And what was that principle? What happens here? <clears throat> Message. See, he was planted. The seed is planted, yeah. Because I, I came into the church in 2006. I wrote 2003 because that's when I started reading the Bible. But in 2006, I started going to the church and I sat faithfully for three years with this woman. She still calls me to this day and I need to call her back because um, she calls sometimes and I don't, I don't get the call. Um, 
but she still calls me to this day. I tried in the early days of understanding this message and I just couldn't get to, to just couldn't reach to her with it. But I still, you know, talk to her and she's probably close to 90 or over 90. And um, and I sat there and I remember saying, Irene, do you ever get to see any fruit for your labor? Because I'm always telling people about the Sabbath and nobody wants to come to church. So, it, 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 you know, here I'm having that conversation with her and I'm not realizing about seed sowing. You know what I mean? I wasn't going to see any fruit. And then I realized you're not going to see any fruit because if you see fruit, you might get yourself lifted up. So there's a danger in that as well. Remember, Jesus said that that you're going to go reap a harvest that you didn't sow. He has prepared this. Not us. Not us. And we have to be safe for that part of the work as well. That we don't in any way get lifted up for the growth of this church when that happens. Amen. If that makes sense. So there's a lot that he's doing on us, in us, and through us if we cooperate to get ready for this and to make it here. Because as we understand it, just from listening to the presentations that take place, that there's still a lot of blindness to sexism. Which is really sad. I don't know if anybody that kind of got um, sideways, but I don't know if anybody has any comments on what we're going through. You know, it's really comforting to me when I look back uh, in my life and see how God was trying to draw me. And of course, I was resisting. And, and when I think of some of those things, you know, I just, I was counting them the other night when I couldn't sleep. And it was just really comforting to know that God, time after time, he hadn't given up on me. He knew that, you know, eventually, because he knows the beginning from the end, that I was going to, you know, come seek him out. But the times I think back on were kind of uh, startling in some respects. I remember this one time. Kathy and I took a, a really long boat trip out in the Bahamas. And we've been gone for months. And we're at these tiny little islands that are, you know, Nowheresville in the Bahamas. And one day we were going to, you had to, fresh water in the Bahamas is very, you know, precious. So we had to take some jugs and go into this well and, and bring water back. And we had to pump the well, yeah and bring water back in these jugs and put it on our, our tank in our boat. So as we're going down this one road, I look up and you gotta understand, this is just out there with nowhere. But you know, the people are, they're surviving and they're doing okay, but they're little tiny little, uh, yeah, I don't know if you, you can't really call them cities and towns, they're like almost villages. I look up at this one very nicely painted blue or a pink building with these like one foot high letters arching over the top of it. And it says Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I'd been running so hard and fast and thought I had left all that so far behind. But that day, the Lord knew I was going to see that name up there and all these memories are going to start flooding back into me. And they did. But, you know, I wasn't ready then. But it was just a marker in my life that I look back and say, like, you know, he, he's, he didn't forget about me. And you know, he's probably snickering, going, I'll get you, don't worry, I'm going to get you. And uh, I'll never forget that island, though. That was beautiful. I'm thankful that he didn't just leave us to our own destruction. Amen. Because I know that, I mean, I know that I have situations back here, too, where um, I, I I, I probably would have died in an accident for sure. That, that one I know. And uh, different areas in our life that we just know that he was there. And, and the more I traced it back, the more I could recognize when the Bible says that before we were in the womb, he knew us. I believe it. <laughs> I believe it. That we really, he really did. But we still had a choice 
because it's called chosen and faithful, right? He calls, he can choose. I don't know if that's the right way to say that, but when it comes to faithful, that's for sure our part, right? Are we chosen by him? Um, definitely called by him. Let me try to find Romans 8. Maybe somebody remembers that verse. It's been a long time since I've looked at it. Yeah, verse uh, Romans 8. I mean, I actually just quoted part of this a minute ago. 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purposes. So even our trials actually... Our trials actually have a purpose, not just for us, but for those around us as well. Um, everything that goes on, because he doesn't, we've been learning more and more about, he. I think it was Bob that said it, he works with what we are and where we are. Was that you, Bob, that said that? Yes. Yeah, so he works with with what, what we are and who we are and where we are. And and um, so it, so it's, it, it, all things are working, meaning what's happening with the other people around us as well. So um, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So there's the call for him, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. So he called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Um, I don't want to touch on the predestination part of that, but because I'm not, I mean, I've looked at it, it's been a long time, but, but it told me that he, he, for me personally, when when you know when I would read those passages, it would kind of melt my heart because I look at who I was, I look at where he's brought me thus far, and I think about could I have ever gotten here by myself? No way. And then I see his grace all along the way, and his mercy, and his goodness, and his kindness, and his gentleness. And how he, as you guys put it, woos us to that point. So when we see the 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 line of the hundred forty four thousand, and that includes the world, I know that I wasn't here in nineteen eighty nine. So how did I come here at this time? It was because. He got me ready. It wasn't because I was in any religion. I wasn't going to church. I wasn't reading a Bible. I wasn't doing anything. So if we can have, we can see that in our, I, I can see it in myself. Some of you were raised Adventists, but I can see that in myself. So then we can see this, you know, when you take the line of the nephonyms, um, you take the line of the nephonyms, which 2014, right? Yeah which is here, and you've got the line of the nephonyms coming along here, that he can do the same for them. I don't know if you can see all the way across there. This is plowing, this is early rain, and this is latter rain, and then this is harvest. So if he can get me to the point where I come and pick up, want to read a Bible and ask, who are you? Then what can he do for these people here? I wasn't reading the Bible. So to me, it gives me hope. But we have to be safe. We have to be safe. Because I know that I was not safe when I was sharing. I, I don't, I don't, I mean, I could probably say thousands of Walter Wright DVDs. When I think about the fact that there was 36 in that set, 37, I think. And I probably sh shared hundreds of sets of them. I was not safe. And we have to be safe for their sake. So God has given us this 
opportunity. And somebody brought up earlier, how did you put it? And I don't remember who it was. Not in this, I think it was in the in Donna's presentation, but about the um I'm losing my train of thought on it, but the 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 um we'll be teaching, maybe it was Donna that said it, we'll be teaching uh David and Moses and all of them. Yeah, because think about that. We have and we've heard it, we've read it in the, in the spirit of prophecy, the accumulation of all the light. And here we are, the accumulation of all that light. If you go from Eden to Eden, to Eden over here, is the accumulation of all that light. I don't know that this is right to say, but if we, well, you, it is right to say equality, right? But all that was supposed to be here in Eden is going to be here. And the accumulation of all that light brought us to um, understand sexism, worship, and racism or slavery. And, and then working it backwards. The accumulation of all that light. So we will have all these people to teach these things. I think that's a really high calling. And uh, we can, I believe we can do it. I always have because God believes we can do it. It's not because we can do it. It's what God can do with humanity when humanity cooperates with him. Amen. So we can do this because he called us. So the, and I remember a verse where it talks about the weakest of saints. I think it's in Psalm somewhere. The weakest of saints would be as David and those is of David, or, or like David would be as God. And what was that verse that was in Donna's study about let this mind be in you? That he did not call it robbery to be equal with God. Well, if we're going to have the mind of Christ, if that's the mind, he says, let this mind be in you, the mind that was in Christ, be in us. Christ believed that it was not robbery to be equal with God. He has called us for something beautiful. If we would cooperate. And if we're worried about the trials, in a little while, we're going home, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I always remember, I can do anything for a short period of time. It's a little harder when things drag on for a long time. And I remember that back when I recognized that my husband was an alcoholic. And I said, this is just a piece in time in my life. And when I get through it, I'll be stronger having been through it. And that was before I picked up the Bible as well. But it was, it was a positive way to me to help me to keep going forward. Because I had since, you know, prior to that, been through some difficult times, obviously, because I was with the emotionally abusive guy back here. And then I get married and he's my friend, you know, every, every, everything. And alcohol consumed him and and uh so i had been through things trials before and what i was able to recognize is that man they're painful when you're in them but there's something about coming out of them the experience and what you learn and you grow and you become a better person some people become a bitter person some people become a better person and i knew that it changed me for the good I did have a negative attitude. I wanted to try not to have a negative attitude towards men. I wasn't a man hater. Um, but now, becoming all that experience was actually for our good, for my good, to, to um, go through and understand misogynism way back here. And uh, so 
Well, anyways, um, it's funny how you that I was kind of like that too, Elaine. After my marriage, I was just so I didn't want anything to do with men. I was done. And uh, but then I realized, you know, after you know seven years and stuff, and I realized in my heart the Lord was saying, you know, that's not that's not Christ-like. You know, because when you think about it, I thought about, okay, who have been the most, who's been the people in my life that's helped me the most when I have been in the worst situation? And you know what? It's always been a man. It's been my dad. It's been my brother. It's been my, some of my guy friends that were just friends. It's been men. So I thought, you know what? It's not... And I knew that wasn't Christian character to have that, that mindset. So I just totally, you know, decided, okay, I'm not going to think that way anymore. Men are, there's good men and there's bad men, just like there's good girls and bad girls. So, you know. And that is so true. I, I think I just matured to the place where, for me anyways, that all I knew is, is my experience, things didn't last forever. And when they end, it's usually pretty painful. And I didn't want that experience anymore. But when I came to the Lord, it was kind of different then because by then I, I felt so, uh, how do I say, I, I didn't know, I didn't know very much. And so when I started to go to the church, it was kind of interesting because even though I was coming to the church with just myself and my kids, Nobody ever said anything. Everybody's always kind of quiet. And then one it was a Friday evening event that I went to. And the kids didn't go. And they were old enough, I guess, to stay at home by then. But the kids weren't with me. And there were two gentlemen, one that's like an usher in the church. And the other one was just hanging out with them. And one of them asked me, oh, is your husband home with the kids? And then that was when I said that, um, that I was divorced. Man, it was horrible the next day. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, I was not there to meet somebody. But I also, you know, if you want to be a Christian and you do want to get married, you think, well, that would be the best place to meet somebody. But for me personally, I was more like I didn't want to I didn't want to wind uh, my experience with men. I did not want to be with somebody that was so far ahead of me. in whatever his walk would be with God. I was also facing the fact that, hmm, you know, God says, remember, we're reading it, I'll say it, the Lord, God says, submit, wives, submit yourself to your husband. And I'm like, I am not going to do that again. <laughs> I am not going to do that. And uh, and so I, I just thought I don't want to be with anybody that's going to be so far ahead of me that it's intimidating to me. But I also didn't want to be so far ahead of them that I had to drag them along like a ball and chain. So forgive me for saying that, but these are the thoughts that went through my head. I wanted to go on this journey and I wanted to focus. I didn't want to get distracted. I knew that if you meet somebody, even if it's all good, even if it's the best person going to last forever, all of that stuff, I knew that it was, that it was going to take up my time. And I, for whatever the reason, was always fixed and focused. I didn't want, I didn't want my time divided. So call it good, bad, right, or wrong. That was that was for me. And I'm not meaning any judgment on anybody else that does anything different. That was just what was drove me all the time was to, to just um, have that freedom to do this as I want. Because I literally think these things through. You know, somebody comes into your life and they want to go here, they want to go there, you want to go take trips or whatever. And it's like, all I wanted to do was read my Bible study and learn who God was. And um and, and I found even with friends, friends had a difficult time with me not having a social life. But that was just a choice that I made. I, and I, you know, I, I, I would say, I, I don't know, so was the Holy Spirit leading me in that? But that was, I was hungry every day. And that's what I wanted to do. But um, so I wouldn't say that I continue to really have this negative attitude so much toward men. But I definitely was being challenged to with I would be would have been challenged to uh, come in a Christian and it says you got to submit to the man. I'm not going to do that. The last time we did that, I got in a mess, <laughs> you know, and I'm, but I'm not going to go do that again. So I'm just thankful to be where we're at today and that prayerfully we can help people 
be safe, to help people. And, and we need to know that who's our worst, who's our worst enemies? <laughs> that was Fergus. He was telling us who our worst enemies are. Who's our worst enemies? Those in the conference? Yeah, I think even in this movement, it's ourselves. Too. What'd you say, David? Ourselves? <laughs> yeah. Um, the ones that are going to fight us against this message definitely going to be those in the church and, um, and even those that left this message. And, and, uh, so we have to have that forehead of flint. And we've read about that in these chapters in Isaiah too. We have to have that forehead of flint. We have to have the full armor of God on. We have to be to, going back to the adult. We have to be an adult. And I think that to be an adult and have a forehead of flint and the full armor of God on. That we have to learn to deal with sensitivity. And that's probably a delicate subject that upsets people. Maybe I, I maybe it's just been easier for me. I don't know. I got hardened. I don't know. But we have to be able to, to address sensitivity because people are going to say things about us to us, and if we live above all that, because the kingdom of God is above all that. We can look and have pity on people as Christ had pity on people. We can look beyond what they say and look at what is driving them. What did we read in the story of the demoniac, right? What do we see Jesus say on the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So we can address the sensitivity by educating ourselves on these things that we've been learning we see that that this message separates people to one side or the other and as it separates friends and family become your enemies they become your mockers and the ones that are closest to you know you well, and they know how to hit you hard. But if we, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, living up to the calling that he has given us, rising above, being a part of the kingdom of heaven, not, of the, not in the kingdom of the right or the kingdom of the left, but the kingdom of heaven, we can look past what people say that might hurt us and have pity and that our only longing be for their soul. And Christ said to love your enemies and bless those that curse you. And it would be like heaping coal. So when things come at us, May they always see Christ in us. Um, and especially because when we go back to looking at here and here, when we go here, that's also going to play a role as well. When we show, I don't know, show, when we express sensitivity, and I don't know, maybe I'm saying this wrong, um, we want to be sensitive to people's feelings. I don't want to say that, but we don't. We, but I think in in the sense of us getting our feelings hurt, it gives Satan a weak spot. What was that story in the Bible where the who was it? Was it Ahab? They got shot. Who was it that got shot? Or Jehoshaphat? Who am I thinking of? Somebody might remember where the arrow went right into between where there was a loose spot in the armor. Anybody remember that? No, I can't remember the name. So you know what I'm talking about, though. Yeah. There's a and and if I think if we had to take that as a parable, it would it would you would think of it as a 
you have your armor on, but you have a little opening in that armor. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? A little opening in that armor. And and uh, maybe you had a, I know I can say I have this happen. I can be broken down when I'm kind of, if I'm already weak and run down, I can be positive all the time, positive this, positive that. And then, but I mean, just might have a series of things and just maybe not enough sleep or something like that. And, and, uh, and then negativity might come out of me. And I really try to manage my life to stay to where I'm not in that mode. But, but it's then when something might strike me and I might get sensitive to, to something. And, um, but I definitely used to be very, you know, very sensitive. So I understand it. But if we can, I think we can take and try to, um, I don't know how we get to this place, but thinking about the armor of God being on us and that forehead of flint and showing weakness gives the enemy, not the person standing in front of you that might have just penetrated your armor, but it gives the enemy, Satan, a foothold. And so I usually try to focus on those kind of things to help me be strong. When you see, we're told to reason from cause to effect, right? So when we reason from cause to effect, if the enemy sees our weak spot, he's going to go after that weak spot until we fail. Because when we succeed, we also help others succeed. But I think if we fail, or we go to the Levites and we go through some big trial and we just show a complete lack of faith, yes, we give them leverage. I was going to read your quote, your other thing you just said, the Septuagint, but I haven't read it yet. So we go, um, we give them a, 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 an opportunity, you know, one arrow weakens you. Gives you another up, gives them an opportunity to reload and and fire again. If that makes sense, I hope that made sense. I wanted to read what she wrote about Septuagint. The Western places instead of waste places. Oh, that's weird. That doesn't she? I don't know about Western places. I remember Adriana pulling up the Septuagint on a few things too, and you're like, what? I don't know. On that. I don't know if you wanted to open up your mic and talk. I don't have any thoughts on that. But um, so I don't know if I've been rambling. I hope it's kind of, I pray it's encouraging and I pray it's not like offensive. Um, but I've always kind of looked at us as soldiers. And I've heard that word being used here lately too, that we're soldiers. And I've always said for a long time that this is like boot camp. And I I'll never forget going and visiting my brother in boot camp. Um, and it's, I don't think it was his graduation. It might have been. But when they opened up and let the families come in and visit and, and uh, talk to him about boot camp. And, but boot camp is to Ahab's defeat. It might have been. I, it might have been Ahab. I can't remember. It was a, someone shot a arrow at a certain something said certain and there was there was a lot of meaning to that phrase I don't remember what it was but um but when we think of boot camp boot camp to go into the military for some of you you could probably say this way better than I can I got my Hollywood education on boot camp and my husband was a marine my brother was a marine so boot camp is Josiah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's Josiah. So boot camp, in order for you to be safe for each other, for all, all your all the other soldiers, you had to go through this stripping down of everything that you were. So these, what do you call them? The sergeants, the drill sergeants? The, is, is that what you call them? The, um, they do a work to humiliate, intimidate, and whatever else they, it is that they do, to break you down of 
everything you ever were so that you're ready to follow orders without question. Because if you go out there weak and you're you're all you're all out there in a what do you call it a company? You're out, is that what you call it? You're out there in a company and you're in a battle. And if you're weak, something you do can cause destruction or disaster for everyone. And you have to be able to depend on everyone. So I've always looked at that as what God is raising us to be, the soldiers, not to go out and fight with literal weapons and, and uh, bloodshed, but with the word of God, the sword of the spirit. And we have to have the full armor of God on. We have to have the forehead of flint. So I think that it would be well for us to address the issue. I don't know if anybody wants to maybe work on a study with it. That would be good. Address that issue of um, when it comes to our feelings and sensitivity and just, I don't know. Does anybody have any comments on that? We can't let our feelings control us. That's for sure. Um, but I think when you're talking about the feelings we have towards other, I think you're referring to the compassion we need to show. Right. Because when people despitefully use us or are our enemies, and and when we just show genuine Christian love that God gives us for those people, that might be the very means of converting some of those people to the truth. Yes. And so, I mean, that's part of the harvest. So two different um, two different sides of that, right? Because I said, right. love your enemies and bless those that curse you. Right. And and when in the pot in the process of doing that. It might not be some of your the enemies or the ones who are cursing you necessarily that are the ones who are converted, but there, there's others who are witnessing true Christianity. And yeah. it's, that, it's that true witness, that being the faithful witness that's going to draw people to the truth. Right. And I think if we, if, if, if we take things personally and get our feelings hurt, it's Either way, there's a cause and effect relationship. Look at what we learned about um, Shem and Japheth. So again, it comes to looking at the looking at the what the goal is, what you want to achieve, versus um, or, or, you know what you want to achieve versus what you don't want to achieve, and then get your actions in alignment with that. So so if getting our feelings hurt. Is going to give a weak spot that weak spot is going to affect others around you like you just said which reminded me of luther when luther asked for that extra day that's always that was one that was always impressive to me why did he ask for that extra day um luther understood this the 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 work or the the moment that that he was he had been called to and he understood that not all those people are going to hear and believe and be on the right side of things. But he understood that there were people that were going to be present that would that his action, his faithfulness was going to affect, if that makes sense. So I think if the way if, if I'm explaining the way what you said, the way you meant it, there's two different sides of that, not taking things personal. But loving your enemies and showing compassion and kindness. But we have to be dead to self. If you're dead to self, then your and your your then your your higher powers are going to be control of your lower passions and your feelings, and so you'll be able to not allow yourself to be intimidated or or offended by things that people say. So you won't personally be offended, but and and on the same level because you are you are having the mind of Christ, you will be able to show love and compassion and empathy towards humanity. And, and so in one sense, they're, they're two different things, but another, another way they're, they're, they're combined because to have the mind of Christ means you are dead to self. And it means that you will be able to manifest those true Christian virtues to other human beings. Exactly. You have both. Yeah. You won't take things personal. And you'll be able to give the right response 
in compassion and kindness. Amen. Okay, so I, so this morning I was, um, well, a few days ago, like I don't, I came across a verse that that I shared. I don't remember where I it was. I wasn't studying. It was something else I came across, but it was um, Zechariah seven nine. But I want to read first Habakkuk one because I was reading in Habakkuk Habakkuk this morning, um, verses two to four, chap, chapter one, yeah. And Habakkuk is um, saying, "O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity?" And cause me to behold grievance. For spoiling and violence are before me. Meaning that's what he's seeing all around. And there are they, and there are that raise up strife and contention. So there's violence and spoiling, strife and contention. And how long before you do something, Lord? Therefore, the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. And I'll go to the verse that I was reading earlier in the week that, that this one, I, you can compare and contrast the two. Because he's telling us that, that this, the law is slack, and he's telling us that um, spoiling and violence and strife and contention is what he's seeing all around him. And the wicked compass about the righteousness. And he's saying that this is wrong, that this is wrong judgment. So wrong judgment equals spoiling and violence, strife and contention. So Zechariah 7, 9 is thus speaketh the Lord of hosts saying execute true judgment. So you've got wrong judgment being depicted in Habakkuk. And in Zechariah, you've got true judgment. Execute true judgment and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. So what's true judgment? in the verse that's the one susan that's the one i was thinking of between the joints of the harness yeah so i'll read the verse again zechariah 7 9 execute true judgment show mercy and compassion every man to his brother so what's true judgment I think it's recognizing the true frailness and weakness of humanity and showing the compassion and like Jesus was saying, forgive them for they know not what they do. Having that spirit, I think that that is what, what that means in large measure. And the wrong way to apply that would be when, like when we look now at the story with Shem, Ham and, 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 and Japheth and realizing that the two brothers were looking at, at, at Ham, you know, the wrong way because they were actually judging him. Mm -hmm. They were not executing, you know, true judgment or, or, or you know, they, they were not doing it right. And um, we can see that now yeah. with the right set of glasses on. So just in looking at the verse, mercy and compassion is true judgment, mm -hmm. which is what you said. That's not what Shem and Japheth did for Ham. Right, but that's what I'm seeing, what, what true judgment is, because... The only people that can judge are those that are without sin. And we know it's not until we're in the thousand years that we can, that the judgment is going to be taking place with others. But until then, the, the true judgment is realizing the weakness and the frailty of humanity and actually having that true compassion that God wants us to have for every human being because hurting people hurt others. And when people are lashing out at you and saying things that they ought not or doing things against you, you don't know where they came from. You don't know why they're doing what they're doing. God does. And all we can do is do represent God as a true ambassador of his heavenly kingdom and let the spirit of God do the convicting with these people to bring them into the fold if, if they will so choose. Yeah. So to me, comparing and contrasting the two verses, you've got wrong judgment defined in the verse as spoiling and violence, strife and contention. And in the other verse, true judgment is showing mercy and compassion. And, uh, and then I added to this, because I actually shared this, I added to this with Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 8, 
when they're asking for a king because you can compare and contrast what wrong judgment is and what true judgment is. And what do we see at stake in the United States, not just the United States, but around the world? What's, what's at stake? What, I don't know if I'm asking that question right, but um, what is just about destroyed? And democracy. I don't know. democracy. Did you say democracy? Yes. Yeah, democracy. So then what's going to be the opposite of democracy? Dictatorship. Yeah, the authoritarian. So, so taking those two verses and comparing and contrasting them to see what wrong judgment is versus true judgment, and then taking a look at, 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 at democracy and authoritarianism. So are we to show mercy and compassion or strife and contention and violence? Um, just kind of went along with some of that, but. So anyways, I hope it's been sort of a blessing. I feel like it was kind of, I, we only really worked on the one verse, but that was what I wanted to at least get at and see where it went. Um, but that in that verse, we see that waste and and if I don't know if you guys read what um Penny put in there in the Septuagint it says that western places instead of waste places I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that I I just remember that a few times Adriana pulled up the Septuagint and I remember one in particular it's like it didn't even make any sense I don't know I don't know what do you guys have what thoughts do you guys have on on that. The only thing I can think of is that, you know, we know that the sun, you know, the way we look at it, you know, the sun doesn't rise and fall, but, you know, the, the message is the truth comes from the east and the sun sets in the west. And so if the truth comes from the east, then the west is always the place that might not have it. So if it's saying western places or waste places, it means the place that don't have the light or the truth. Um, that's all I can think of. I have no idea. Well, I'm going to go back to that verse because I think the rest of the verse kind of helps us with it. Because the um, if, if you were to use the word Western in the Western places, because I think the next part of the verse is defining what that means as the wilderness and the desert. Does that make sense? And the wilderness and the desert spiritually are, are, are void of, of water or truth or light, you know? Just... And if you don't have any water or food, what is it? It's a waste place. A waste place. It's a waste place. So I don't know that in that aspect, at least, I don't think that that one would be correct. But don't ask me, I'm no pro. I mean, it just doesn't make sense on that one. So uh, when you guys are speaking of this Septuagint, what what is what is exactly what is the Septuagint? I'm I'm not. If if I Bob may know better than I do, make sure I don't say this wrong. Septuagint is when the seventy under King under King James, the seventy that got together and translated the Bible. Is that correct? The Septuagint, uh, is the, Greek translate, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and it's the Old Testament. Back in Jesus' day and Paul's day, that's all they had. And the, the, the main language that was spoken, like, you know, English is the main language of the world. At that time, the main language was Greek. So they all read the Greek Um translation of the old testament which is then i did have it mixed up thank you which is so the translation of of the of the bible then yeah so they translated the hebrew the testament into greek, greek. They, okay. they took the hebrew because before before you had the greek translation it was hebrew nobody spoke hebrew it was like a lost language 
And so they, you know, Egypt, uh, I forget, I think it was Ptolemy, uh, some, one of the Ptolemies, and he commissioned those 70, 70 Hebrew scholars. Yeah, that's where I got that confused. Thank you, because I knew the 70 was in there, but I knew later when James did the, they did the King James, there was, if I remember right, there were 70 there. So my bad on that completely, I mixed it up. Um, the King James, the King James, the Old Testament was not translated from the King from the Septuagint. It was translated from I don't know which one it was translated from, but it wasn't translated from the Septuagint. Yeah, and I remember Elder Permitter talking about the Hebrew going the Hebrew language being. What did he say? I think he said too simple because they used too few words. Maybe somebody remembers what he said about that. Yes, he said that they, it was too simple because they used male and they, they used right, gender. right. They used gender, so you only had male and female. So everything was was uh, interpreted with either male or, or a gender. Right, right. Whereas Greek had many, many different interpretations, which was better. So I don't know. When it comes to Western places, to me, I don't know how that could make sense in there. If it's if what we're reading is correct, if I if I'm correct in how I say it, that that the waste places are being defined as the wilderness and the desert. I think it was Ptolemy the second that commissioned the Septuagint. Okay. I know it was one of the Ptolemies. You guys definitely got me there. I had it mixed up with the wrong place. It's about 2,500 years ago. <laughs> okay, so any other comments before we close? Maybe somebody do a review. Who wants to meet Christine? I'm sorry, I got distracted by some issues. Oh, sorry. So you don't want to you don't want to try to just do a quick rundown of that, or do you want me to have somebody else ask somebody else? I probably missed the last thirty minutes. Oh, okay. So, um, Bob, how about you? I'm going to only pass because I didn't miss the last 30 minutes. I missed the first few <laughs> minutes, so <laughs> I didn't I didn't catch the whole thing to be able to, uh, to 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 put it all together. So my apology. Oh no problem. Anybody else before I try to jump in and do it? Bell, Logina. Okay, so we'll just kind of do review. Try to review it real quick. We were looking at. Verse three, Isaiah 51, verse three, and um, picking up that the waste places are being defined as the wilderness and the desert. We went and looked at the wilderness when Christ was in the wilderness, understanding that that's this dispensation for the priests, the harvest, where there's um, in the wilderness where he was tempted. And the first temptation was to turn these stones into bread. We understood the bread to be a message and the stones to be the world. And the temptation in our day is to go to the world for a message. Um, and we saw that when um, in the Uganda presentations, as we were going through those, that that after 2019, you have, you know, they had 2019 coming out of conservatism. And then you have those that are believing that God is about freedom. And so as long as we pass the test of equality, we're all good. And the methanims or the Michael Moore, the first angel, is giving the true message of equality, therefore reason from cause to effect that the Pope is going to probably be a methanim. So the temptation in this dispensation is to think that the world has a message for us that the world can teach us because they understand equality and we didn't. 
so we need to go to the world. So the temptation was about the, the message. So we saw that the wilderness is related to um, wilderness is related to a message. We saw that the desert in the desert, you go into the desert and there's no rain, um, no water or no rain and rain equals a message. And we know that in the harvest that there's no message. Um, but God says that he's going to comfort Zion in her waste places, in her waste places or the desert and the wilderness. We know that we're in the wilderness. So it's no message here. But yet he's going to comfort Zion while there and make, make her waste places like Eden, which Eden is then defined in the verse as the garden of the Lord. Um, and we just briefly looked at um, and we saw what he's restoring from Eden to Eden, the equality issue, sexism, worship, and racism, and as a chiasm, racism, worship, and sexism. Um, we saw that the sword is the word of God. So if there's a famine, and I think we went to, chapter, to verse 19 and saw that, that where, where he brings desolation and destruction and famine in the sword. So there's no sword, there, so that there's the sword of the spirit, the word of God isn't there. And so there's a famine there. If this is all correct, this is what we went through. Okay, I'm not saying I'm all correct on it, but that's what we went through. So um, so the famine, there's, there's no word of God there. But we still see though, that he comforts us here. So how did he comfort us here? And I think I erased part of it. What we were able to see from last night's study, what we were able to recognize, let's put it that way, we recognize what we did not recognize before is that the 2016 election, if I'm safe to say this, it wasn't, it, it was about Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, but it was about more than Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, if that's okay to say that, I don't know. But Hillary Clinton stood for women's rights and she stood for the LGBTQ rights. So it became this battle over equality. And we didn't see it because as good, seventh, good faithful Seventh-day Adventists, homosexuality is a sin and women are supposed to submit to their wives. So as good faithful Seventh-day Adventists, the church is going to go to bat for, try to, to get um, women elders. And at the same time, we're working on voting, electing a, a female president and church is on the wrong side. God in his mercy sees the danger of those that love him being faithful to a false message and throws a brick at our head, I've raised the brick, throws a brick at our head to wake us up to understand what we did not see here. So though there's no new, no new message, we, there is a message because it's this message that God has given us time, not just us time to understand, well, yes, us time to give, but some of us didn't even come in until right at the very end. So he gives us this time to get this message so that we can understand it. And we know that we are... We know that we have an increase of knowledge and a formalization of the message, right? And in and, and here is this test. And if we still carry with us the wrong idea of gender and our sexism, we'll be on the wrong side, whether we know it or not. We'll be on the wrong side of the issue. So that was basically what we looked at in there. Any comments or questions? Good summary. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bob, would you like to close in prayer? All right. Dear Lord, please be with each each one of us who are who are being led by your spirit help us to to keep our eyes heavenward and continue to to um, refine us 
and to purge out anything, any of the dross that's in our lives. Help us um, and prepare us for the work that we are about to be being involved with. Help us to be true ambassadors for your heavenly kingdom and to represent you rightly. We know we can only do that by, by yoking up with you, for we know that, with, that through you all things are possible. And I pray that you'll continue to lead us and guide us as you've been doing all along the way in our lives, long before we even knew it. And please bless everyone that is, is, is um, studying and learning and wanting to know the truth. And I just pray that you will um, continue to, to help us to, to be faithful and to learn what we need to learn and to unlearn the things that we need to unlearn. And Lord, I thank you for your angels that are doing a mighty work in our behalf as well. And I just praise you for your, your mercy and your love. And I ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.